I know this was supposed to be a video about Nitty, but as it turns out, there isn't a whole lot about obscure Italian politicians from the early 1900s that aren't things he has written, so I'm putting him off for now and sliding everything else forward. Anyways, today's topic is Jelko Rajnadovic better known by the considerably fucking easier to pronounce pseudonym Arkin. Now odds are you probably haven't heard of him, and I hadn't either until the man was requested. After learning about him, holy shit, this fucking guy. He was basically in the business of speedrunning the seven deadly sins, doing everything from petty pickpocketing to crimes against humanity, all while looking surprisingly dapper in the process. Jelko Rajnadovic was born on April 17th of 1952 in the town of Brzezice in southern Slovenia, at this time a part of Yugoslavia. He was the fourth child of a Velko Rajnadovic, who was a colonel in the Yugoslav Air Force, so naturally the young Arkin would travel a fair bit. He spent time in Zagreb and Pensevo, eventually ending up semi-permanently in Belgrade. He lived with three older sisters, and by his own admission was beaten rather savagely by his father, which definitely could explain a few things later down the line. His dad also happened to have friends in high places, most notably the chief of the state security service, think the Stasi. And since he spent a lot of time away on military business, Arkin ended up with this guy fairly often. It's implied that he helped them out a fair bit, especially later in his career, mostly on issues of dealing with people they wanted gone. And a quid pro quo with an organization like that goes a long way. This will become important later, so just keep it in the back of your mind. Like Rockwell, his parents got divorced when he was rather young. However, instead of turning to extremist ideology, Arkin decided to just be a fucking crime lord instead. It naturally started pretty small, stealing purses and wallets and such when their owners weren't looking. He was a dumbass 14-year-old at this point, though, so he got caught and spent a year in juvie before his dad decided he was going to Montenegro to join the Navy. This wouldn't come to fruition as he was arrested for several burglaries in 1969, serving another three years behind bars. He was just getting started, though. Immediately after his release in 1972, he would fuck off to Western Europe. Illegally, of course. Forged identities and all that. I don't know if you were expecting him to immigrate naturally. It is thought that the name Arkin came from one of these forged identities, in case you were wondering. His time in jail and with the UDBA gave him numerous connections with other prominent Serbian criminals, and he would use this to his advantage to build a reputation of simply not giving a fuck about the word of law. His first stop was Belgium, where after a string of bank robberies, he would be arrested in December of 1974. He would spend five years in prison, however, he would pull off an escape in July of 1979. He would obviously skip town, going to Sweden, performing two armed robberies, then going to the Netherlands and performing three more, all in the space of about three months. That October, the Dutch arrested him and he was jailed again. His contacts started to help him considerably, as only a year and a half in, he had a gun smuggled into the prison, which he used to break out again in May of 1981. He immediately decided to pillage West Germany, robbing several places and getting arrested less than a month later. He had a shootout with the police, because we can't not have one of those now, can we, where he would get hit. This put him in the prison hospital, which he pretty much just walked out of a week later after shaking down the first guy he saw for his clothes. He spent the next two years continuing his rampage through Sweden, Austria, France, Italy, and Switzerland, robbing pretty much anything that had cash. He would be arrested a final time in Switzerland in February of 83, but he broke out of jail again by April. His rapid-fire furious shit posting landed him on Interpol's most wanted list, and he finally decided that maybe he should cool it, and so he headed home for Yugoslavia. Except fuck you, this guy is all gas, no brakes. A few months after he gets back, he, probably, robs a bank in Zagreb. The feds kind of knew it had to be related to him, so they went to his mother's house, in plain civilian clothes, mind you, to try and find him. He wasn't there, but they got her to phone him and tell him that unsavory individuals were looking for him. Arkin shows up with a gun, and we all know what happens next. Neither cop was killed, thankfully, and he was promptly arrested. Of course, as I said previously, the man redefined the term friends in high places, so he was just let go two days later. Let me repeat, he shot two federal police officers and walked. This fucking guy, dude. Anyways, through most of the 80s, he helped run a club and gambled like a madman. One time he almost killed a guy over a game of poker, was tried, admitted to being in bed with the secret police, and was jailed for six months. Pretty standard stuff. He pretty much lived your average mobster life until the 90s, where I finally acknowledged the elephant in the room and talk about the ethnic tension ripping Yugoslavia apart. What, you thought he was just a regular criminal? <laughs> nah, he was in the mood to add war criminal to his resume as well. Of course, as with all things, the Yugoslav war started with a European football riot. He was at, and would participate in, the Dynamo Red Star riot, which made brutally clear the direction the country was going. In a sign of things to come, Arkin would raise a paramilitary force called the Serbian Volunteer Guard, which would come to be nicknamed Arkin's Tigers. This is where shit starts to go down. Croatia would functionally succeed in 1990, which pissed off the Serbian minority who started taking shit over. Arkin took a trip to these rebel areas to help arm and train their troops, but was arrested by the Croatians in November. He was jailed until June of 91, where after his release was negotiated and he went home. But actually no, because he immediately got into a fight near Osijek. Afterwards, his Tigers were based semi-permanently near Erdut on the Serbian border 
border, where they would get up to all of their collective tomfuckery. His little army was made up almost entirely of criminals and literal football hooligans, and would ultimately come to number somewhere around three to five hundred men. Of course, the guy was still a mobster at heart, so his army was also entirely privately funded, with much of his equipment sourced through smuggling operations. The next five years saw your standard Yugoslav war stuff, meaning war crimes, ethnic cleansing, forced conscription, and other fun and wholesome family-friendly activities. He would rotate between Croatia and Bosnia, spending plenty of time in eastern Slavonia around Vukovar, as well as several places in and around north and northeastern Bosnia, the most notable of which being Banja Luka. The Serbian state media also ate this guy up. Kill a couple Bosnian civilians and suddenly you're a national hero, a patriot, and a military genius. This aggressive propaganda gave the Tigers a certain aura of, of authority, striking fear into the hearts of everyone they would come across. Not to mention the guy basically ran Slavonia for a while, using the place for his racketeering and smuggling operations to kill some time while he waited for his next fight. Can't really blame him for that though, if you were a mobster and given a money-making opportunity like that, you would take it and run. At this point, the guy started getting ambitious, more so than he already was, which naturally resulted in him running for a government position one time, but he wouldn't end up winning. He left Slavonia in 1993 to do this, and in the process he would meet a woman who he would get along with very well. Her name was, uh, Svetlana Sisa Vilichkovic? We're gonna call her Svetlana. She was a turbo folk singer, and that's pretty much all that matters. They married in 1995, and they had a wild over-the-top wedding that was broadcast internationally. He did have a wife before this, but like father like son, so a divorced, and she would take the kids. Around this time, the main Yugoslav wars had ended, and the hag was on his ass, but, spoiler alert, they wouldn't have much time to hunt him down. The last few years of his life were surprisingly normal, well, normal. He continued his criminal empire primarily through smuggling operations and ownership of various companies and even a football club at one point. This, along with your standard mob practices of extensive racketeering and, and intimidation, kept him a very prominent individual. He would have two kids with Svetlana during this time, over his life having nine in total with no less than five different women. Yeah, this guy fucked. Anyways, Twilight approaches. NATO would intervene in Kosovo in 1999. Arkin was naturally upset, but there wasn't a whole lot he could do but bitch to the media since NATO was only bombing them. Side note, he is consistently described by people who met him in person as a well-dressed gentleman, so my earlier comment about him being the snazziest war criminal in recent memory absolutely stands. He also adored the media attention, going out of his way to talk to anyone who would listen, and even those who probably didn't want to. Since foreign journalists were basically stuck in the country with nowhere to go, it was free real estate for him. Around that time, it was also announced that he had been indicted by the International Criminal Court for wiping his ass with the Geneva Convention, more specifically several instances of unlawful detainment and massacres of people. For his part, he didn't seem to care all that much, since ultimately he was basically untouchable. He had a shitload of money, his hands in government, and significant control over the underworld. However, as a result, much of said underworld was beginning to resent him for a myriad of reasons, but primarily the fact that his control was fucking them over. Enter Dobrosov Gavrich. He was a junior cop at this point in time, and it's believed that he had ties and connections to some shady individuals behind the scenes. On January 15th of the year 2000, Gavrich walked up behind Rashnadovich in the Belgrade Continental Hotel and shot him and two of the people he was with several times. He was rushed to the hospital by those with him, but he wouldn't make it. He was 47 years old. Gavrich would fuck off to South Africa, and Arkin's buddies made a bunch of heads roll, but this couldn't change the fact that he was very much dead. He was buried in the new cemetery in Belgrade with military honors and thousands in attendance, thus bringing an end to the Odyssey of Arkin. And that's all she wrote. I'm uh, continuing the trend of somewhat controversial individuals, if you couldn't tell. And yes, I know this guy isn't exactly from a map game, but he was requested, so of course I'm going to cover him. Let's hope I didn't piss off some Serbian ultranationalist in the process. Anyways, that about does it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.